right, welcome to another episode of the ADH Dads. I'm CJ. Hey, I'm JJ. Thanks for listening, guys. I'm glad you guys are tuning in. Uh, this episode, we're talking about uh, dating after divorce. So uh, another topic that doesn't really have a clear answer or a decisive uh, solution as uh, our favorite thing to talk about and discuss as people with ADHD. So, <laughs> uh, But I think that this is kind of an interesting thing to discuss on the show, um, you know, uh, both being co-parents, uh, both coming from previous marriages, uh, not that we know it all or anything like that, but, um, you know, I think uh, that maybe if we gather our experience here, we may be able to form an Ultron episode of, um, you know, advice or helpful hints uh, to anybody that may be, uh, you know, thinking about dating um, at post-divorce or anybody thinking about dating somebody with kids you know so uh yeah man i'm glad to have you here jj how was your week oh man it was it was interesting man you know uh with a kiddo with adhd being home all day and i'm working through the week we had a week for sure there was uh there was many times where i had to remind him no i can't play mario brothers right now because i am in the middle of working and i'm sorry and then you know uh, maybe 20 minutes goes by can you play now? I'm like, well, no, I still got about four and a half hours, uh, you know, keeping working here. But uh, it is what it is. Uh, Cohen's uh, loving his Christmas present, which, as you can imagine, was Mario Brothers. And he's having fun. And his favorite character is Drybo. It's that little skeleton turtle that walks around and falls to pieces when you jump on his body and then comes right back and reanimates and stuff. So he's been all about that. It's been fun. He's 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 a, just a hilarious kid to watch play that game. Uh, sometimes he t- says that the game's cheating or, you know, the, the controller had an issue and stuff. So <laughs> come so on, we all not- use that excuse when <laughs> we played video games as a kid. Come on. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I get to witness my, my little self in his current self, uh, which is just hilarious. So no, it was, it was a, it was a fun week. A lot of it, a lot of it was spent inside just simply because of, uh, you know, his exciting new toy, which is, which is a Nintendo and, and we got out here and there, but, uh, it was it was it was good, man. Post holiday, we make it work and we have fun, and uh, and then we get back to school and routine. Which honestly, for talking about ADHD in general, routine is is a solid thing to look into for everybody. Not just kids with ADHD, <laughs> parents. Everybody needs to have routine because everybody benefits from routine. When you don't have a plan, you have chaos. So, anyways, we had a little bit of chaos this week. It's all good. How about your week, man? Oh man, it was good. Um, speaking of. Uh presents and one of our favorites you're talking about mario here last year we got a um mario kart uh but they're like rc cars and they hook up to the 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 nintendo switch so you can actually like cruise around your living room and create tracks under your coffee table and you know around your dining room table so dude that our kids are still getting enjoyment out of that and that got us through covid and quarantine days i'll tell you that's a fun one dude i I, I almost got it one year, but now that I live in Salt Lake City and they actually charge you your arm, your leg, and like half your 401k when you uh, when you rent here in SF, or Salt Lake City now. <laughs> um, I live in a one bedroom with my kiddo, so we, we, we have limited floor space to, to play that game. But otherwise, yeah, man, that's a, that's a fun one. So glad you guys had a, had a blast. Uh, probably scaring the crap out of the dog. <laughs> yeah the dog uh we actually got i can't even count how many rc cars this uh year our our little one is like into cars so much <laughs> and he's been driving the, the dog nuts <laughs> <laughs> but just terrorizing the poor thing with with cars chasing them the dogs chasing the cars <laughs> that's awesome and and sad at the same time i suppose <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah right. but uh so today, yeah, we're talking dating after divorce. I suppose maybe we should give a little bit of context as to uh, what we might have in terms of the experience leading into this discussion, huh? Yeah, definitely, man. I mean, um, I think I've mentioned my story before, but if it's your first time listening, um, you know, I'm a stepdad. Um, I, I came into to my dynamic here. Um, uh, both uh my wife and I were, you know, uh well into our, our separations and and uh about a year or so um into that. So that was kind of something that we kind of bonded over, you know, if you could say, and uh trauma binds people together as they say, you know. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it was definitely something that we we could connect with and, and talk about and, um, you know, had similar experiences with. 
Um, so, you know, going into that, there was definitely, uh, you know, trial by fire, a lot to learn very quickly, um, you know, with a five-year-old, a three-year-old and a three-month-old you know, um, as you know, uh, their separation and as often is, you know, can be messy. And, uh, you know, um, I, I was, uh, familiar with that in my own kind of process too. Um, <clears throat> you know, so, um, I think that there's a lot to, a lot of questions and a lot of boundaries, a lot of stuff to, to discuss there. And like I said, I, I kind of had to learn very quick and, and both of us, uh, kind of being, uh, new to the dating world again, post divorce and, and kind of still in our separations. As, as things were getting finalized, which, um, you know, could be a, a hot topic and, and controversial for, for uh, a lot of people out there and a lot of different dynamics and perspectives. And, you know, certainly was for maybe some of our partners on the other side of things or some family or friends watching things to unfold. So I thought that it would kind of be an interesting topic to kind of dive into and kind of give you guys our experience of, of what that looked like for, for me and my wife and kind of how we got to where we are today, you know, three years later and a year into marriage. What about you, brother? What is, what does uh, dating post-divorce look like for you? Yeah, man. Well, you know, give, give uh, again, you know, like I know we've talked about the stuff before our history to a certain point, but I, you know, it's, it's a good thing to kind of reiterate some of the important things regarding uh, the topic of, you know, the, the, the day and, uh, um, yeah, dating after divorce was, was, uh, in some ways, many, it, it experienced, um, I experienced many challenges. Um, I also experienced a lot of growth and understanding of myself and, uh, and I got to experience women, um, who had different needs and different desires and, and, uh, you know, had their own, uh, deal breakers essentially. Um, and, uh, I had two significant relationships, uh, post-divorce, which I divorced back in 2018. So over the course of, I guess, well, uh, four years now, um, just over four years. Yeah. Two, two significant relationships, which to me makes sense, you know, as, as they were significant, each one of them. Um, but, uh, with that in mind, um, a big part of dating after divorce in my situation definitely was what does this look like for my kid as well? Because, uh, when you have children, um, and you've been through divorce and stuff, you, you have a kind of a different outlook as to what dating might look like. And, uh, and I would say that one of my faults that I experienced in both significant relationships, um, after, after divorce was that I introduced my son to them fairly early on. And, you know, a kiddo with ADHD, uh, it's transitions can be hard, uh, introducing, you know, somebody to a, to a kiddo who has, you know, already been experiencing a little bit of the unknown. What's, what is life look like now, now that my parents are divorced and living in separate households to have a, a new person introduced, um, too early in the process, uh, could result in their emotional, um, health being put into, you know, into a, a state of, uh, compromise. Um, so not to say that, uh, that I did do things wrong, um, with respect to him, but I do think that, uh, that I did introduce him a little bit too soon in the relationship. And, uh, how, and that, how, that uh, actually... how, how soon was too soon? What are we talking here? Like when did you yeah, start well, talking or did you make fish things official first? And then what was the, what was the time span? I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, you know, when, when you're, when you're in that new relationship and it's, you know, it's got that shiny new, uh, new look to it and that, that amazing new smell and whatnot. Um, you start to, you start to, lose sense of a little bit of priorities. So, you know, we got kind of that infatuated honeymoon phase going. Um, um, my first relationship outside of uh, divorce. Um, and, and it just seemed like, oh, everything makes sense. You know, we're, we're we have so much in common, you know, it's like, well, we, we have things in common so far. <laughs> but uh, she was just so, so interested in my world and my life and stuff that she was coming over to my place constantly. She had a roommate at her place. There's that. But just just we were getting so much involved in, in time with each other constantly that she wanted more all the time, which, you know, in some ways sounds sweet, sounds great. But also, you know, it does it does tend to, you know, result in, in you kind of ignoring other things. Um, maybe trying to take it slow and take some time to really 
really figure each other out. What does day to day look like as opposed to I'm just so excited about this person and I'm and I'm just I just want to have them with me constantly. Well, you know, you're you're going to have to fall back into certain patterns, too. Um, and one thing that I was doing was still, you know, becoming this new single father and taking care of a child. Uh, so so suggesting to my child that I, I want to somehow include him in my happiness was kind of a, you know, a skewed view of what was really taking place, which I was happy. Yeah. For a time, but I also was still learning this other person. And um, I know I made a list of things that I, I would like to talk about at some point here in, in our discussion, but um, you know, I think everybody should be well aware of what are, what are some of their deal breakers? What are some of their um, you know, red flags and, yeah. What what do your values look like? You could you could go. Let's say you could go to the same church as this other person. Well, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden all your beliefs line up or your political stances, you know, whatnot. There could be some very big differences between people who essentially say they believe in the same thing. So yeah, I was yeah. still in the discovery phase with this person when I introduced her to my son, and she was absolutely loving and you know just just really kind to him. Um at the start and it was great it, it just felt it just felt like hey this is this is really going to be something amazing and it was amazing for a time but of course you know we like i said we were still learning each other and because i introduced my son so early to her i didn't have that opportunity to just like focus on her when i was with her and then refocus yeah. you know back on my kiddo when i was with him um and not to say those two didn't you know exist apart from each other either they did but then there was just too much involvement right away. And then I, you know, I learned some things about her that I would say, you know, were unattractive. Um, one could put it as, uh, you know, we had a different stance on, uh, you know, maybe a moral philosophy or our politics or, or whatnot. There was just some differences and I was actually getting kind of concerned. Um, in fact, she challenged me in a way that was very uncomfortable for me. It wasn't as much as a challenge as much as it was like, an assumption that I did not see things the way they should be seen. So more or less suggesting, nah, you, you're wrong. You, you obviously don't have things right. And, uh, and this was what all of a sudden, after I had already introduced her to my son, I was receiving from her. And it was one of those things where I'd say it's, it's the basics. These are the, these are the certain topics that, uh, topics and values that one holds. And it's good to have those conversations, maybe, earlier on, if you're starting to feel something for somebody. And if you have that one-on-one -on -one time with them, you can really flesh that out and then figure out if the two of you are really well designed to fit together. And, uh, and yeah, I think we, uh, we kind of missed out on an opportunity there and bringing my kiddo into it, unfortunately means that my kiddo has to go out of it eventually too. And he's going to suffer a little bit for the, you know, the, the breaking off of of the two of us well i think that's what the challenge is in uh post-divorce dating uh is like how you know when you're single and you're getting to know somebody you know you there's there's a, a longevity to it you know well you there's well you find things out about later maybe you withhold some information oh, i'm not gonna tell this person that quite yet or maybe i'll agree with them now but you know down the road we'll have a more in-depth conversation about this political thing or this religious thing or this family thing you know where when you have kids um that kind of goes out the window right <laughs> like it's like you want to like get to the bones of it you want to get deep quick but also you have to have a patience with it because there's that fine line of when do I introduce my kid to this person? Mm -hmm. what, how, what, what does that conversation look like uh, with my kid, you know, about yeah. this person? And, you know, what does interactions look like? And, you know, at what point do you start introducing um, rules with this person or this or that or rules with this person and your kid? Or, you know, it's just very um finite almost it feels very finite in the way that you gosh you have to get everything off the table now and you want to know everything now but you also have to take it slow in a certain degree and you know um but there there's a, a little bit of haste to it right or or necessity you know uh with those conversations that maybe you dilly dally around in your 20s or or pre-marriage or you know without kids in the picture 
Yeah, and, and you know, I'm uh, dating dating when you have kids is definitely a topic for for a, a whole episode. Again, you know, we have, we have a lot we could talk about. I will I will say that you know that the other relationship that I had, uh, um, I think she had an interest in kind of trying to move along quickly as well, and uh, and she she wanted to she wanted she told me pretty early on that she would she didn't want to give me an ultimatum. But in a way, the, everything that she talked about was kind of ultimatum talk. Um, so it put me in an odd position. And, um, you know, Cohen, she treated Cohen so well. In fact, uh, she she has a child who also um, has ADHD. And and so there was a lot of things I was learning from her because her son was older than, than, you know, than Cohen. And she has had more experience. And her level of patience and understanding and empathy was just such an admirable thing about her. And I fell in love with a lot of, you know, everything that she stood for. It was amazing. Um, and then with the whole dating with kids, you know, side of it, uh, her son wasn't too, too fond of my son and he would vocalize that regularly. Yeah. He would say, he would say like, I, I don't want Cohen to come over and I don't want him to, I don't like him. And so it was, it was rough. And what, what is really hard See, that's Colton, a whole is other a, layer to the dynamic right yes. there right like you yeah. know, the yeah. grown-ups can like each other but what if the kids don't like each other what if the kids don't like the grown-ups what if the grown-up doesn't like yeah. the kid so many yeah. layers <laughs> yeah right, there was sorry, there was ahead. one no it's great i appreciate that that's a it's, it's a really good commentary on that um there was one memory that will stick out for me probably forever it is uh she met up with Cohen and me at this beautiful lit up tree in the city we used to live in. And, uh, you know, we were just having an evening together. Um, and it was, it was pretty cool, pretty special. And then on the way to our cars, cause she showed up separately, we were walking in the parking lot and, um, and I was holding Cohen's hand and uh, she was walking on the other side of me and, and Cohen actually walked around in between us and put our hands together, hers and mine. And I was like, gosh, my kid really wants this to work out. And he's still like, he's, he's still, you know, months after we broke up, uh, he specifically, you know, would ask about them and want to go see them. And the, 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 the thing that I think I failed at in that relationship, uh, buddy, is that, uh, I wanted it to work out with her. I really did. And I wanted to work on it as much as possible. And that, that, issue whatever it was between our boys it kept keeping or it kept me at a distance from her and that was that was very difficult to it's still difficult to to you know to think about the fact that it didn't work out essentially i believe because i was afraid of that dynamic in its in its challenge so yeah the kids thing is huge in so many ways and because, you know, we go, we're in an age where a lot of people do go through divorce and kids are involved. It's a, you're right. It's a layer. It's, it's a multiple layers and it's, it's a challenge. So dating after divorce, especially with kids is something that we have to talk about regularly, how delicate it is and how valuable our children are in that. And what do our values look like? Getting a firm understanding of our values, especially when we have kids, well, anybody, honestly, but you know, when you have kids, I think it's, it's, it's a non-negotiable. You got you got to work on yourself because you have a little one involved. Well, you know, it takes a lot of maturity to date. Um, you know, and then you throw the maturity that's required for having a, a kiddo in the mix and having to make these hard decisions like you're talking about, uh, you know, as is this good for my kid or, you know, sure we could maybe make this work or maybe force this or maybe through time or this or that or yada yada. But, you know, I mean, that, that could be the detriment to some, some blended families and some second chance families there, you know, um, and a lot of resentment between kids and parents and kids and kids and kids and step parents, you know, so it takes a definitely another added level of, of maturity maturity and, and, and self-awareness, um, to kind of go into this process. You know, I was pretty lucky with, um, the, the kids here, they, they took a shine to me pretty quick, you know, um, in, into the, to the, um, sense that we, you know, had to really kind of discuss boundaries and, and stuff. And when, you know, I think the first, the very first time that I did meet them, uh, you know, maybe about 90 days or so in, into us kind of talking, meeting and getting serious. Um, in the very first time that they, they saw me, they said, is, is Colton going to be our new dad? 
you know, and who, you know, that's a, that's a heavy hit. And, you know, not only for me, but I'm, you know, sure if that was mentioned to bio dad on his time, I'm sure that's going to be a heavy hit for him to hear, you know, and I'm sure a lot of single guys may be going into a dynamic meeting, uh, a woman with kids and you hear that on the first date that could send a lot of guys running, right? Like, that's like, Oh, didn't think about what that, that was going to feel like, you know? Um, but, and I think that, you know, that was really kind of, uh, what what landed me in into the advantage or the position that I am now and where I'm at in this relationship was um, just a really, really big openness and curiosity of this, knowing that I was going to be a fish out of water in this scenario. Um, and that I had to like relinquish all kind of power in here and kind of, um, you know, um, let let uh, my, my partner lead in, in what this looks like. I, I don't have the experience in, in parenting. So, you know, how can I just support this woman in this journey and, and learn along the way? You know, and I think that it takes a really big openness on both parties post-divorce um, to do that. But also, like you say, with a balance of, what are boundaries? What are hard nose? What are the delicate guidelines that kind of need to be navigated during all of this? I got to ask you a question, uh, Colton, with respect to the, uh, you know, coming into a family of kids and stuff. Um, what did that conversation look like uh, when you two were considering, you know, introducing you <laughs> to those kiddos? Um, yeah, you know, and, you know, we were talking kind of, uh, before this call, before we hit record on this call about, you know, everyone's kind of has a different set of rules or a perspective on rules. You know, you were telling me that, you know, I was telling you that, um, a lot of my friends were telling me, you know, post-divorce, you know, uh, for every year that you dated, you need six months of healing time. So, you know, if you, we were dating for 10 years, I had to wait five years before I was ready to date again. You were telling me that it was one year of dating and you needed five years of recovery was the rule that you heard. So, you That's know, what by I your heard, and I was like, yeah. you are all <laughs> insane if you believe this. <laughs> <laughs> so you still have another, you know, 31 years, JJ, before you can hit the market again buddy you're like prime age yep, yep. <laughs> dry age rib man you gotta wait <laughs> yeah can't, but, can't uh, wait to can't wait to meet her at the at the graves uh that we're digging for each other <laughs> <laughs> the retirement home is where you can pick up on your your ladies <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know and, and it was kind of the same w with kids too you know that conversation kind of looked the same and you know um when we had kind of talked about when that might be a appropriate or, or necessary, you know, uh, that, well, Oprah says this, or the Kardashian said this, well, I heard this, or, you know, <laughs> six, you gotta wait six months, well, three months, you know, so, I mean, we kind of went into it uh, with, okay, well, I think, you know, three months is would be good, and we'll see how this goes, and where, where this takes us, and, you know, we got involved pretty hot and heavy and you know it was pretty pretty serious and you know that that puppy love and that infatuation was pretty strong and, and attracted us together and you know we i i would like to say that we still ride that out three years later you know yeah there's a there's a so quote-unquote honeymoon phase and all that but you know a lot of our conversations revolved around what is what does this relationship look like when that when that goes away you know, how are we still going to show up for each other? How are you going to be there? Are you still going to want this? You know, and those active conversations kind of helped guide us along the way. And those kind of check ins, you know, are you sure? Is this too much for you? You know, like, and I think with just that kind of openness <laughs> of, you know, checking in with me, checking in with her, you know, where we're at with divorce and this and those were a lot of hard conversations right i mean not typically first date kind of stuffs but we're going in you know hey here's my divorce this is what happens you know all oh, these are the mistakes i made and you know this is what i'm going through and this is all the luggage and baggage that i have you know and i mean we you know we we skipped a few stages in there to to, to get into some really deep conversations and and, and fortunately, I think that that's really what, what bonded us together is that willingness and curiosity to have those conversations and not be scared of them, not um, want to run away or, or shy away from that or say something that maybe sounds good in the moment. Um, but it was like, a, yo, this is where I'm at and this is me and 
these are my boundaries. But and luckily, we were just so aligned in that place of our life and, and the commitment that we were looking for and the direction that we wanted to go. Those core values just synced up so, you know, harmoniously that it, it honestly, JJ was easy, you know, and, and I know that these conversations aren't easy and they weren't easy conversations to have, but how we handled them was just easy in the sense that we were just so aligned with a lot of that stuff. So, you know, and it's actually, I, one little funny story I kind of want to tell you is, you know, while I was, uh, when we first met, you know, it was kind of right at the very, very early stages of COVID. Right. And, um, you know, I was working several jobs, freelance photography, and I was working for some theater and, and doing some writing and, and acting and editing and whatever I could do to make ends meet. And I, one of the things I was doing was tending bar and waiting tables at Chili's. And, you know, I would have the, the mask on all the time. And, uh, you know, uh, Maritza would actually bring the kids in and come sit at the table and I would serve them. And and I would, uh, you know, we'd, we have this little kids drink at Chili's, you know, it's called the Blue Lagoon and it has Swedish fish in it with some like, you know, Sprite and little blue dye in there. So I'd always come out and I'd always bring the kids that and I'd always bring them a little extra serving of Swedish fish, you know. And uh, when I finally did meet them, you know, we went out to like islands and got some burgers or something. And I met them and they were like, oh, man, Colton, you'd really like this this place, Chili's, that we go to all the time. There's this guy there. He's super nice. He, he gives us Swedish fish all the time. And they never knew that they met me for like months and months because I had the mask on. And, you know, we never made an, a formal introduction. She would just kind of come and sit and enjoy, you know, a, a, an employee discount. And I would, you know feed her and the kids, you know, during COVID. And so it was kind of just this nice little story of they met me before they even knew. And, you know, the fun guy at Chili's, they still don't know is me. <laughs> oh, man, that's incredibly sweet, dude. Um, love that story. And, and yeah, the kids, the kids actually like putting in the effort to tell you about this guy who's pretty amazing at Chili's is, <laughs> is just kind of, it's just the, you know, it's the bonus of all that, that, that great story. Uh, I wanted to circle back around to one thing that you said specifically because um, I think uh, it's 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 really clear that it's an important thing to practice every day in your relationship, um, dating, you know, dating after divorce, and uh, you know, courting and marriage all the time is that level of curiosity you talk about. So you know, um, we we have this tendency most people do at the beginning of a relationship to be very interested in the other person and maybe over apologetic and all that stuff. And, but we ask a lot of questions and we, we show curiosity. And then a lot of times people get in that tendency after they, you know, been together for a year or even less than that, you know, a lot of times uh, to stop asking the questions and stop showing curiosity and stuff. So, you know, saying, uh, you know, asking, asking, you know, tell me a little bit more about that. How are you feeling about that? What, uh, you know, what is it that you learned from that? And, you know, just keeping that level of curiosity, showing that interest in somebody, that's what, that's what a lot of people need. I know that uh, the women that I've dated have very much appreciated it, that I pursued them as, uh, you know, through question and curiosity um, as the dating, you know, uh, months continue. Um, if you drop that from the relationship, that's going to, in some ways, suggest to this person that, you know, you were really just trying to win them over um, for something and right, the, exactly. the real, the real authentic guy is showing up now. And that, that's, that's, uh, that seems to be in misalignment to the guy that she was excited to continue this journey on with, you know, so, uh, so keeping that, you know, level of curiosity and the questioning and stuff with her is definitely a, a strong testament to the positive, uh, relationship that you have. And that's, that's key, you know, bringing that into this relationship and shows that you two have this alignment that's working really well together. And, you know, and the fact that you've probably uh, given those kids uh, a few pounds of sugar um, while dating their mom is just a, it's just a, it's a sweet little story, my friend. <laughs> man, are you, I can't even get them off the sugar now, man. It's completely <laughs> backfired on me. Now they know, they know I've got sugar in my pocket. They come to me and they're like, where's the candy at, mom? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, even if they were wearing masks when you when you gave them the sugar, those pupils are pretty obvious. They're there, like, oh my god, this stuff's the best. You know, you, at that point, you've lost the battle. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. You're, we're, we were talking about curiosity the other day 
too um, on another episode. And, you know, I think the great thing about curiosity is like, you don't have to have like a direction for that. All you have to do is just be curious, you know, and one, one question kind of can lead you to another, you know, and as long as you, you, you practice that, you know, again, I like what we're talking about here. I think that the, the potential for where your relationship can go um, is, is really limitless. You know, if, if you can have that one piece in, in your relationship um, and continue that, uh, with longevity, I think that you guys are, are off to such a great start. You know, um, I, I was, I'm really blessed that I kind of started this relationship, uh, the way that I did in being really curious about how to be a better dad, how to be a dad. You know, I, I didn't have the nine months of, you know, what to expect when you're expecting book to read and the, the prep, it was like, boom, here's three kids. And like, don't, fuck it up right like you, you don't want to mess up these kids and you know like there's little humans and this relationship isn't just on the line but there's like three other relationships with three other little human beings that are on the line right and like you, that has to be in consideration about that and um you know i and i joined dad groups and and started doing a lot of self help self health self help work god i need some pronunciation work but uh, <laughs> anyways, you know, I, I started doing that because um, I, I wanted to just arm myself with tools and knowledge and, and perspectives going along this journey, um, you know, because it was so great and I didn't want it to end and I wanted to this to succeed, you know, um, and I and I feel that a lot of guys that that join dad groups or, or these self-help journeys or, or or pick up some of these books that we talk about on the show, um, you know, it's it's five, ten years into their relationships and there's a lot of um, a lot in the wake there that they got to sort through a lot of history, a lot of, a lot of traumas, a lot of, a lot of triggers and buttons that have been pushed and set and, you know, standard operating procedures um, that you got to work through. And, you know, I was really fortunate that when I started this relationship, we were both in a place of like, let's, we want to learn from our mistakes. We're, we're going post-divorce. We're, we're seeing therapists. We, we want to grow. And what are the lessons that we're learning from this, from this? And, you know, that, curiosity um, and to grow and learn really kind of set us up to ask these curious questions and and to not have to sort through kind of five, 10 years of damage prior to that, you know? So um, keeping that curiosity going um, has been a lot easier than trying to, you know, start it uh, smack dab in the middle, which I think a lot of guys in, in, in marriages do. So, you know, I think that, again, you you um, also are kind of in a, a, a good position in, in, in that journey of, of getting to know somebody, you know, because you don't have to do all that prerequisite bullshit conversations that we were just talking about earlier, you know, like you can just go right into it. What are your core values? What are you going to do? <laughs> what, what do you want from kids, you know? what is what does that look like to you so um you know it's it can be a little daunting too but um i i think that those conversations are are where the meat in life are you know and uh that's what i want to get to right away so yeah man i, I appreciate the uh, the comment there uh too about my situation and i'll tell you that the one thing that uh, that does remain of challenge um with another person is still even if you have your core values figured out is is reminding yourself to be curious so you are being showing up for that person so you can you can best present your own self to them um there's there's nothing there's nothing better than giving you know somebody your your full attention um when you're dating them and and really you know really hanging on every word and asking follow up questions and stuff because a lot of times people will give you a sort of a sort of experience a sort of piece of their lives and there's so much more that kind of came into that story than what they've told you at that point so digging deeper is is just a huge part of showing showing them that you are somebody who's not interested in just filling a you know a hole in their life but really truly trying to you know uh learn somebody to to find a partner because you you want to you want to see somebody else you want to see the world through the lens of somebody else's eyes and really, you know, really study that and grow with it and, uh, and, and be a cheerleader for it. Um, and it's, yeah, again, it starts back with that, that curiosity and stuff. And of course, you know, I, I'll probably transition in, into, uh, kind of some of the notes that I wrote down here, um, um, as well, just so we can, I can give you kind of like JJ's list of do's, don'ts, I don't know, all the, 
all the follies that might happen <laughs> if you're dumb really? like I was many years ago. I've been saying but, I want to uh, write a book called like uh, Idiot's Guide to Dating a Woman with Kids. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, man. Sign me up. You should, you should write it, uh, Idiot's Guide to Dating a, an Idiot with Kids. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, the ADHD or the ADH dad uh uh dating dating hell and and highlights. <laughs> yeah, so 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 a lot of the stuff we've been talking about is kind of just like what I've touched on in in, in some of my notes that I wanted to re- you know read aloud here if you don't mind. Um please. Yeah. Some of the kind of like the things that that I'm I'm no expert in this and of course my experience is still very much limited. You know, I I'm just uh in constant admiration of the people who got it right the first time because i i've made many mistakes in relationship over the years and sometimes i've brought to a dating relationship too many things instead of like presenting myself as somebody of curiosity i'm presenting myself um in front of the person that i'm you know actually sitting in front of so uh yeah all right so i'll get into like the post divorce jj notes for dating <laughs> Uh, one of the things that we talked about earlier is timeframes. And I simply wrote that timeframes are different for everyone, but one thing should be universal. Leaving what happened in the past will be a big help in the success of a new relationship. If you bring the stress of your divorce into a relationship, it's an indication that you have work to do um, in, you know, and process what happened to you previously and what you contributed to in your divorce. So sometimes when you bring the stress of a divorce specifically to a new relationship, you could, you know, you could be presenting that to a person who is trying to get to know you and instead you're, they're getting to know what you didn't like about your other person, right? <laughs> or the other person. Um, right. So uncoupling, We've all been on you know, that date where they're talking about their, their ex and everything that was wrong with them and yeah, <laughs> why and they I, shouldn't I think, be on this think, date with you in the moment. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's 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 actually a commentary on you more than it is a commentary on another person, which is a fascinating thing to think about because really they're not they're not hearing that person's story, they're hearing your story and how you perceived something. And that's tell that's telling of you. Um so I guess what that, you know, all that being said is like the uncoupling process uh it's it's difficult and and in some ways, you know, maybe you won't ever truly be uncoupled from somebody. And I just simply mean that their story is written on your story. You know, you're, you've written on their story. They've written on your story. So there is mm. some sort of, there is some healthy resolve in finding closure through that. You know, if you can, um, it helps us go through the grieving process. And then it also helps us work on ourselves when we go through that. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe we carry something that we learned good or bad from our ex. Uh, and that's okay. As long as we can also bring that in a healthy way into the future. So uh, basically leading ourselves to a healthier version of ourselves. So that was number one on my list. <laughs> um, I think numbers two is something that you talked about and you talked about it in a way that, that, is, that I really admire in your relationship with your wife. Um, you know, you understand yourself and your values. Uh, understand what you're looking for. Uh, know it and be open and honest about it. The more open and honest you are about things, the less you will have experience in you know, relationship erosion later on when yeah. you know you decided to cover something up and then eventually it's going to come out they, these things come out they always do why because your core individual doesn't allow for you to just completely erase that from who you are so yeah. you know if if you're uncertain about what you're looking for you focus on yourself what what do you have to offer in a relationship um after yeah. divorce a lot of times we are again we're trying to go through that uncoupling uncoupling process i've talked to a number of guys who are like i i'm just i just need to figure out my identity Like, yeah, absolutely. You're going to feel loneliness, but if you haven't figured out who you are, take some time. It's okay. You know, we don't have to wait five years for every year we were, you know, married, but, you know, take some time, really figure yourself out, giving, giving yourself the luxury, the gift of loving yourself um, and really identifying who it is that I am is going to benefit your future partner. Why? Well, it turns out I hate bowling. Uh, or something, you know, that, that could be a thing. And, and this person really loves bowling. You'd be like, well, I'm, I'm sorry. That's just not what I'm interested in. If you want to do that on your own time, there you go. Having a healthy, you know, conversation about it rather than saying, oh, well, you know, I'll, I'll just do it because they want to do it. Like, you're not really, you're not really giving yourself the, the, the gift of, you know, standing up for who you are. And yeah, bowling's a silly example, but still, does it actually hold weight to you? Making sure that you understand that is, is important. 
You're speaking my language, brother. Uh, I think this this is my superpower and my kryptonite. Uh, you know, <laughs> honesty is 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 one of my uh, core values. You know, and uh, I, I try to really live transparent. And you know, I'll throw all of my baggage at you in our first meeting. You know, and <laughs> you know, these you are know all the I'm mistakes that, I made. Colton? And <laughs> what's that? You know what I'm going to say to that, buddy? Is is this is a huge thing for me? And I know there's going to be controversial or or just like difference of opinion opinions on this, but just hear me out. What you suggest right there is like, I'm going to give you my trust from the start. That's what you, that's who you are. And that's, that's who, where I, where I stand too. I believe that my trust is given. It doesn't have to be earned. If I go into a relationship where I'm saying this person needs to earn my trust, well, what am I doing? Am I putting them at a disadvantage already? Are they at a deficit from where I am? Do I have some sort of like high and almighty, you know, stance above everybody else that they need to come yeah, up to me? Yeah. Like that's, I, I just, I, I, I really have a hard time with people who say, you know, I, I, and I've been hurt and therefore I need you to earn my trust because that's yeah. suggesting again, that, that, that right. you are, you are down here and they're up here and somehow you have to work your way up there. And that's, sure. that's difficult for anybody to hear, I believe. And, and um, it is hard sometimes to just say, I'm going to give you my trust. But the benefit of that is you also, like you said, you're open, you're honest, you're giving somebody exactly who you are from the start. So you can find out, does this person line up with me? So I, I really appreciate you, you know, jumping in there and, and making that comment. Cause that's, I mean, that's, that's where I've been passionate about trust in relationships for, I think my entire life. I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I really do because something that I've always, always said in my life and the way that I go about, uh, you know, personal relationships and interactions is trust until you don't have a reason to trust. You know, some right. people kind of go in with it with that mindset that you're saying of I've been hurt, so I'm not going to trust or I put up walls or I'm not going to tell this person this or that. And and like I said, I, I've always been someone that just kind of throws myself out there in our in our first meeting. And, you know, I know that the ones that stick around, uh, you know, once they get all that information are, are the real ones, you know, and but yeah. but I also have a lot of, uh, you know, sometimes I worry how it, they affect those personal relationships, too, you <laughs> know, and, uh, you know, again, I just kind of throw out all my bad at you and it probably leaves you in a whirlwind like jesus christ that guy really opens up to you huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you know it's nice not to have those skeletons in the closet right you know i mean honestly i don't even have room for anything in my closets here anyway so people can well feel. well to go back to um, what you're saying buddy yeah. you know it's if if we're not honest with ourselves and we don't have that transparent and and we're not honest with other people then and not and in turn not honest with ourselves then how are you ever going to get to know that core person inside of you you know if if you're scared to to really uh ask yourself what an answer looks like and why you feel that way and where that comes from you know um there's not a lot of growth that's going to happen right and and that happens a lot with relationships like you say people get uh less curious they start compromising more and more or they say that they like things when they don't or or vice versa you know and and you have to be uh curious in a way that 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 supports you know what we're talking about here yeah man absolutely and uh to make it all seems kind of silly but also there's some truth to this it's like let's say you have a child and uh at three years old they're they're telling you lies. And then you have another child, a newborn, and you say, well, look at this little liar right here that we just, you know, just gave birth to. Like, <laughs> does somebody else need to carry whatever it is the other person that you have had experience with? Do they need to carry that as well? Do they need to be responsible for that? Do they need to somehow apologize for that? No, that sounds a lot like baggage and stuff that we haven't worked through. Uh, it sounds like something that instead of, uh, instead of trying to create closure, we're actually we're actually instead creating a, you know, um, a gaps between us and, and, you know, really connecting with somebody. Yeah. So what's, uh, um, what's number three. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of asterisks to this, this initial, uh, uh, you know, uh, statement, but leave your ex out of it is kind of the, the, the note that I made. And, um, mm. I guess there's, so I'll break it down. I've got, I've got three, a, B, C, D, um, but you know, kind of what went wrong in your past relationship can be left there. Similar to what we were talking about with the trust thing too, right? Finding that closure and then moving on to be able to present your best self and a positive person to this next person. And I'll break that down a little bit more. Um, I think the best thing you can do is take the lessons you learned from the divorce and grow from them. Um, 
you know, if, if you're stuck in the past and you can't take ownership over certain things, um, I would imagine that there's something that we're missing here and we are unable to really bring our best selves to the next person. Um, going a little bit deeper in the X thing, uh, probably shouldn't talk about your ex, or if you do, don't badmouth them. Uh, attraction usually involves positive vibes in dating. So if you're bashing your ex or place blame on them in front of a new partner, I mean, the message is bitter and it actually makes you look bad because you're essentially taking obviously something that was contributed to that didn't work out and suggesting that it's all this other person. And we know that's never the case. There is definitely obvious, uh, you know, moments of, of abuse where somebody needs to get away. And I, and I totally understand that. I don't want to, you know, suggest otherwise there. Um, but when it comes to relationship and stuff, there's, there's, you know, with, with the majority of uh, relationships gone to divorce, um, both parties have ownership that they need to uh, take over or take on. So um, it's, it's usually a clear sign that you're more focused on how you were hurt rather than your ability to take ownership of yourself and your actions and how you've grown when your focus is in on what the other person, what the other person did. Um, but, you I, know, I, I mean, know a lot of oh, people yeah, find kind of fall into that, that trap there of, of blame or this or that, or I, I didn't get this, or I was thought that I would get this if I did this, or I was hoping for this and it never happened. So I became this person, you know, there's a lot of that, um, blame and, and, and victimization in a lot of these, uh, scenarios, which I think is really kind of hard to get past. And something that's always stuck with me is in a book I read, it's, it's from Douglas Abrams. It's called the book of joy. Um, and it's about, uh, the Dalai Lama and the archbishop, um, getting together for a week of conversations about joy and what that means to them and, and the religions. And, and, uh, one, one of the sections is about kind of sorrow and loss and how that's important to joy. Cause you know, you wouldn't know what joy feels like without that loss, right? You need a little bit of, of pain to make you, uh, appreciate the sweetness, you know? And, and I think that that kind of methodology can be applied here in, in the co-parenting post-divorce, um, dealing with, with your exes, you know, instead of that victimization or that, that pain that's often felt in these, these scenarios, you know, I'd like for a lot of men to try to reframe that into, you know, this, that, that, that pain's there because there once was something good, you know, and how can we kind of connect to the, that, that good there with our exes, um, post situations to kind of create those co-parenting dynamics that we've talked about in previous episodes, you know? So, um, you know, like you said, yeah, a healthy, healthy relationship with the, with the ex, or at least a, a healthy mindset with the ex, I think, uh, really serves, serves someone going into a, a new dating scenario. Yeah, man. And it's, it, it, it's at one point we were, we were madly in love with this person and, uh, you know, they were, they were everything we wanted, um, and more or whatever the, whatever the romantic language was that we used at the time. And, uh, and to somehow get to the point where it's like anything and everything they do, we just are disgusted by is, is definitely an indication that we have not worked through some of those emotions to, to get to where we really need to be with this person, because this person again was somebody that we pursued for a time and, uh, wanted to be with for the rest of our lives if we got married. Right. And then if we have kids, you know, the science, it, you can't just say like 50% is, of them is written on your child, but there is some truth to the idea that, you know, your child's inheriting qualities and true, like quality qualities from your ex. And uh, if you look at your ex in such a bitter way, that's in some weird, strange way, it's, it's suggested to the kids that they already are at a disadvantage and they have, they have serious flaws. And they're, they're stamped that way for life. Um, so yes, uh, really kind of working through that emotion and, and uh, taking ownership of yourself in the process and then reminding yourself like this is a person that I really, truly deeply loved at one point is important to be able to move forward, I believe. Uh, well said by yourself, buddy. Um, and, you know, one other thing about the exes too is is there's a, there's a decent chance, you know, you talked a little bit about yourself as well, is that, um, you know, well, if your if your new partner asks about your ex, it's to me I think a good good way to respond is to provide facts and take ownership of yourself. Um, more often than not, questions about your ex ex are actually really questions about you and how you handle yourself. 
So when well, you, you know, can do, that, oh yeah. Sorry, no, no, no. Um, I was just going to say, I think that that's kind of again what what really set us up for success here in 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 my current marriage. Here is um, when we had those conversations, we we weren't shying away from talking about the exes, and 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 we didn't talk about them in a way that was like, well, this person did this, and this is why I'm here. You know, it was more like, well, look, these, I can only speak for myself and these are the mistakes that I made. And this is what I'm, you know, learned from it or still learning from it. And this is how I hope to grow. And the conversations really stayed in an area like that. Um, and that felt healthy and it wasn't like a, a finger pointing kind of dynamic. So, you know, and I think, like you said, that that's very important, to, you know, whether you're talking to someone from that comes from a previous marriage with kids or without, or, you know, you're looking to date someone that comes from a previous marriage, you know, I think that that kind of healthy mindset around that extreme ownership that we talk about is, is really the, the kind of key taker there of, is this person ready to move on? Right. Because we can talk about all these rules and all these different opinions and all these different people that are going to give you all these things from your friends to your family to your ex to, you know, so and so. All these people have all these opinions about what is the right time. But ultimately, what it comes down to is no one can decide this except the two people that are looking to get into this relationship. Right. And that comes like a certain amount of 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 trust there from ex-spouses if 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 there's a parent still involved in that um you know because i i think that's something that we should talk about too is you know even though you may be ready is is your ex ready for you to start dating and how do you handle those conversations and what that looks like you know but that's whatever point question. i was trying to make very before i i forgot but <laughs> uh, adh dad uh, yeah, we uh, we're, <laughs> we're gonna is, have a little little sound down, bite that goes every time we yeah. we forget our train of thought is the ADH dad. Yeah, ADH dad. <laughs> <It's a little laughs> <bell. laughs> oh man, this is what makes it so special, honestly, buddy. Is 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 this ability to talk, this ability to talk on something and get those nuggets out there because the nuggets don't typically typically come in just a a, a thoroughly you know uh, uh, ironed out speech. For us, it's going to come in those moments of, of casual uh, improvisation and stuff. Um, so, no, I appreciate that. And that's to me, honestly, like the nuggets were there and uh, and that's what matters. <laughs> ADH dead. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, yeah. So I guess uh, another thing I you know, I added, I think this was point four was um, and, and there's caveats here. I said there's no there's no reason to jump into a new relationship. And that's not me speaking against, you know, the successful relationships that do come from somebody you you happen to meet or had maybe even met prior to getting divorced and stuff. Um, it's not it's not saying, you know, shame on that idea at all. But really, the idea is like, make sure you take it slow. Um, you're out to find the best person for you, not run away from loneliness. Right. Um, sometimes being alone is a good opportunity to study ourselves and learn about our values and identify or in our identity from within, you know, identity is first found within. So if we're looking to have a relationship to find identity, we're going to end up disappointing ourselves and probably the other person. So again, it's not really the timeline thing in that, in that point of focus. It was more, you know, what is it that you are, um, what is it that you're aiming for in relationship here? Uh, don't jump in if you're not sure. Um, all right, I'll go to point five right away here. Uh, if you're dating after divorce, uh, chances are you know more about what you want and what you definitely don't want. Um, I think divorce kind of kind of gave me a little bit more clarity as to uh, the things that I'm maybe a little less inclined to, you know, let go. I guess is one way to put it. Um, so if you know your deal breakers or can identify the red flags that would erode a relationship with someone, take them seriously. You know, it's, it's, if you notice it early on and you're like, oh, you know, maybe I can look past that. You're not going to be able to look past that. I mean, if it's, if it's something like maybe they clip their toenails, you know, on the toilet or something, you know, minor, maybe there's a way to get around that. But, you know, I'm talking about red flags here, stuff that, that we consider deal breakers. Like if you can look into the future and say, yeah, this person's do doing this on a daily basis, or this person thinks this way. And politically, I can't agree with that. That is that is something that's against my values. Well, I think that's something to take seriously. Um, you know, you probably experienced some of those in your marriage and maybe even before you were married to that person and ignoring them just didn't work. So, uh, you know, 
really pay attention to that stuff. Um, it's important to take your values seriously again with you, with your identity. So what you're saying is don't bring your old relationship to the table, but be able to talk exactly. about it and be curious, but don't talk about your ex and to have boundaries, but also be curious when those boundaries don't meet within your boundaries, but also have hard no's. There you go. <laughs> There you go. It sounds words, like just dating, dating is, in general, right? Yeah. It's just yeah. Like in other completely words, dating contradictory is simple. And- <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, yes. That fine line, the eggshells, all those things. That's why we have all these terms, you know? Because <laughs> we, we as human beings still present our fully beautiful, flawed selves every day, right? <laughs> yeah. And that, that leads into point six here, which I said, give yourself grace. Have realistic expectations. Fights will happen. Take ownership of your actions. Ask yourself honest questions. Be real with yourself. You don't want to go through divorce again. <laughs> you want a healthy and happy love. So, uh, yeah, if you if you learn about yourself and what you know what causes triggers or what creates these triggers to just you know um, bring out your worst self, really lean into what I can do to improve myself. Therapy is a great thing. There's, I don't think anybody has good enough reason to suggest that therapy just would never work for them. Um, therapy is a great opportunity to uh, to find yourself and help find your other person um, through that process. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of my, my big thing. single ladies listening, <laughs> JJ's phone number is 555-3575, and he likes long watch on the beach, and he is a single father. <laughs> <laughs> Voicemail is totally empty, so you can call me when it's time. <laughs> yeah. No, but man, last- you know, I... I, it is hard to to date after kids, and and you know, I'm, I'm my wife has expressed the kind of you know thoughts that went through her head, and um, you know, post divorce and kind of early into that process, and you know, who's going to want to date a, uh, somebody with kids, and is this too much, and you know, at what point are you going to go running? And I know that there was a lot of kind of doubt and insecurity running through her head about, you know, even though this guy says he wants to stick around and he wants all this responsibility, you know, he's been around for five months and these kids have been around here for five years, you know, and it's a whole different ball game once you're, when she gets some years behind you, you know, and again, and it's been a, it's been a learning curve, you know, but again, I think what has set us up in the most opportune spot is uh, I think what the theme of, of the, our conversation here is, is that curiosity, you know, um, the, the curiosity w- with still being able to have um, boundaries and be able to express those in um, a healthy way and to be able to um, be curious and to talk about that in an open way. You know, because I think the the, the big <clears throat> mistake that people make with dating in general is, um, you know, those, those hard, hard no's, you, you know, those... Well, you know, this person doesn't make this much a year. Or this person isn't this, or this person doesn't come from this background or this lifestyle, or doesn't have this name, or whatever it may be. You know, and they and they just cut people out of their lives. And and I'm not saying that that's necessarily bad. You know, um, you know, some people need those hard boundaries. And and I've talked to to quite a few that you know have some pretty. So a pretty long, long laundry list of check boxes that they need checked before that they can then move on a relationship. And kudos to you, you know, if that's how you you have your relationships. But I think that there's also just an opportunity um, to you know uh, to learn, you know, e- even if this this relationship doesn't doesn't go um, by by stopping the conversation and not being curious uh, throughout this process and not knowing why somebody doesn't like pickles or, you know, doesn't eat this thing or doesn't, you know, uh, go to this certain place or use this certain thing or come why they come from this background. If you're not curious as to that, then I think that you're just really kind of limiting yourself into um, relationships that that don't bring a lot of growth to the table. So, you know, is if we can stay curious, I think that th- those are the, the relationships that will serve us in the most healthy way. Mm. Yeah, well said, buddy. And, uh, Having that curiosity it, when, you know, you mentioned the kids thing, um, having that curiosity for the way the person parents in some ways, 
when you're dating and you have kids, you have a leg up over the single people who haven't even thought about the kids part yet. And then later on, they're like, oh, well, I was thinking we'd raise them this way. I was thinking we'd raise them Catholic. Well, I was thinking we'd raise them atheist. You know, who knows uh, what, what it would look like. I, I could tell you in one of my two um, significant relationships that I had post uh, divorce, um, there was a major difference in terms of how we viewed one particular thing with when it came to parenting, and that was corporal punishment. And um, I told her, I said, I could never hit my kid. And she's, she said, it's not hitting. And I said, well, to me, it is. And uh, we, had a, we had a major disconnect. She was so angry with me that I, I didn't see it the way, she want, they, the way she wanted me to see it. And I said, you know, that I, I'm too afraid of the idea of striking my kid as a way of punishment. I don't think that, that actually results in, in success. I don't think it results in anything. I think it's a form of escalation, which is designed to create fear in your child. Do I want my child to fear me? No way. I want to listen to my child. I want to keep that curiosity going with him because I think that will create trust and respect between us. Um, and that was a major, I, I guess you could call it a major red flag with that person. No, that's a big um, one. Yeah, that's a big one. If, if you're not seeing eye to eye on that, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, the audience might have their own thoughts on it, but that's really just kind of where I came from with it, with my values. I could not possibly consider that option. And she she was very upset at me for, for not considering the option. And to add to that, again, back to ADHD, I have definitely dive pretty deep into the content of how to raise a child who's, you know, on the, you know, who has ADHD. And um, there was one source in particular that talked about an, uh, a child with ADHD will want to crave your attention in any way they can get it. They want to have connection. Um, I had last week, I was in a meeting with some coworkers and I specifically told my son, hey, buddy, I've got a meeting. I need to have quiet. And you know what happened during that meeting? You got quiet and then he went away. <laughs> yeah. He was louder and more disruptive during that call, that meeting, than he was the whole entire day. And what that told me was, this is exactly what I've been reading about my ADHD kid. He's getting, he's getting that connection. It might not be a positive one because I'm getting upset. I have to remind him yet again, hey, man, I am in a meeting. This is important. But what did that do? It got my attention. It got some connection for him. So and then I think back to this person, you know, who suggested that my son was, you know, difficult, which in some ways, some days I could use the word difficult with him. But if I'm giving him the connection through hitting him like that is that is the worst way for him to remember how he was able to connect with his dad. I don't want to connect with my son by by putting him in a corner and making him afraid of me. Well, I'll tell you real quick, buddy. Uh, my dad used to give me those uh, those paddles that had like a little string to it and a little rubber ball <laughs> that you, you'd, you'd play with for hours. And when they would break, my dad would make me give them back to him. And he'd use those to spank me with it, man. And now I cannot play ping pong or table tennis. I'm just traumatized. From it. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen my son, you know, show a little bit of fear in just when I get you know, escalated with my words. That scares the crap out of me to think I could, I could get him even further afraid. And, you know, I mean, I talk about that knowing full well that I, you know, sometimes we parents, we, we escalate because, you know, maybe we've lost control of ourselves. And then also maybe our kids push our buttons <laughs> over, over two dozen times. My kid is interrupting my meeting with, with his noises while I'm telling him, Hey buddy, I need this focus. <laughs> At some point you're just like, this is crap. I'm upset. <laughs> well, I mean, what we're talking about here, later. You know, what, what we're talking about here, you know, I mean, my dad moves too fast to scratch his head and I still flinch as a 35 year old man. So, you know, it's, so that corporal punishment, you know, what you're saying, it, it has an effect. So, <laughs> yeah. And here's my weird, weird, weird way back to the, the topic at hand today is that, uh, you know, knowing, knowing how somebody uh, might parent children, um, through the dating process when, you know, you yourself or they have kids is in some ways a major benefit to your relationship because a lot of people don't have that discussion early on. They might say, how many kids do you want? You know, they don't, they don't say like, uh, which, which, uh, do you want to use the ruler or the yardstick? Or, you know, they don't, they don't go to that length of the conversation. <laughs> 
Well, this has been good stuff, man. A um, lot of uh, info and and contradictory uh, advice here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, we uh, listen. We gave you a warning before we started this episode. There's no right answer here, so you know you've been warned. You chose to sit and listen to this, so it's on you. But um, I'm glad you joined me, JJ, and uh, thank you guys for listening to us. Um, hope that you continue this journey along with us. Uh, please like, share, subscribe. Uh, please, we love to hear back from you. So if you have any comments or or things that you uh, think that we should talk about or, or touch on or or some feedback on some of the things that we have, I would uh, sure love to hear your opinion i'm sure jj would too um so thank you guys uh for tuning in and until next time this is the adh dads i'm cj i'm jj thank you much see you next time see you guys